Hi, I'm Alistair Ben, and this is Vision and Light. This week I'm talking to someone who I met back in 2014 when I was visiting the Canadian Rockies. Uh, he is an incredible adventurer, someone whose energy, enthusiasm and commitment to the Canadian landscape and the landscape further afield uh, is absolutely second to none. I was always impressed with his courage, the boldness of his compositions uh, and the attention to detail and humour that he manages to inject into quite a lot of his work as well. I'm talking about Paul Ziska. Uh, he's a resident of Banff uh, in the Canadian Rockies and gets to live in one of the most beautiful places in the world. Paul and I had a very incredible conversation. It was uh, full of energy and so much uh, insight into Paul's relationship with the landscape that he loves. Something that's also just quickly worth, worth mentioning before we start this week's episode is that I've started a new Facebook group called Vision and Light to accompany the YouTube and podcast series. On there, we're forming a community of like-minded people where we can add additional content like behind the scenes footage uh, and some of the other insights into the people who are on the show. And secondly, to push forward with the concept that it is the landscape that is the most important thing. And everyone who's on the show is genuinely showing their love and care and consideration for the landscape and it's that that needs protecting it's that that needs our support so please consider going over to facebook and asking to join the facebook group vision and light and we will be delighted to have you on there as well so let me introduce to you mr paul ziska <laughs> Paul Ziska, how are you doing? I'm doing good, Alistair. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. As you can see, I've got a great white north uh, backdrop to make you feel right at home. That's very thoughtful of you. Just when we get out of winter here, you you bring me right back. Uh, well, we, we, we all miss it already, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we had a little chat before we came on air and I was explaining the main reason why I wanted to talk to you. Um, just for the listener's benefit, uh, you and I met back in 2014 uh, in the Rockies. We were in Mount Assiniboine together. Uh, we had Adam Gibbs there. I think Callum Snape was there as well. Um, so there was, there was just this really great weather and we had these amazing conditions. Um, and I was really impressed by your energy and your enthusiasm. And obviously I'm a big fan of your work. And the thing that's always really resonated with me is your relationship with the landscape, your passion for the landscape and the amount of energy that you have for this passion. Yes, I can. Yeah, I can truly say it's the um, it's the landscape that fuels fuels my efforts out there beyond. Yeah, I love photography as a creative output for sure. Um, I love I love just sharing my view of the world with others, but I think the main the main thing that drives me to just get out, lace up the boots, go out with the camera is just an appreciation for really how much the landscape has done for me, for 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 my soul over the years. So right, that that no something we decided right, right away was is that we weren't going to have a script, we weren't going to have an agenda, we weren't going to have a tick box of stock questions that I was going to ask you. So there's the perfect opportunity that you've lined up for me, which is what sort of things has the landscape done for your soul? It's well, for one, I think, um, for one, I think, you know, in, in an era where life can get so busy and so overwhelming at times and where there's, there's always lots of expectations and lots of demands. Um, I found that the landscape really gives me, puts me, um, puts my mind at peace. And I find that it really gives me much needed perspective. Um, 
and you, you know what it's like. You're, you're overwhelmed by something. Um, you've got a lot on your mind and you've been on the trail for 20 meters and already you can see, you can feel everything fall away and you feel better immediately. And, um, you know, so that, that's, that sense of perspective, um, has really been something that I've been looking for in the, you know, in my outings, trying to just trying to simplify uh, a life that can get busy very, very quickly. The other main reason I would say I, I like to go into the landscape is just to satisfy curiosity. Uh, I think I feel, I feel like there were times in my life where I lost, I lost that sense of curiosity again, because it was maybe obscured by expectations and, and the desire to do other things. Um, and, and photography has allowed me to um, sort of rekindle that sense of curiosity. And I found it to be pretty addictive. I just, I feel like a four year old again, and I, I just want to see sort of what's around the, what's around the bend, what's over the hill. And I just love how, um, how the landscape makes me feel like like a kid again and and almost almost immediately the second mm. that i step into the wilderness i feel i feel just rejuvenated again and i find that it's especially in these times where i can't experience i'm not allowed to experience it in the same level as usual i realize how important and how crucial that's become to my own in my own life Totally. Now, one of the things that's been becoming a sort of recurring trend, I mean, I was speaking, it started obviously, obviously with Mark Adamus, Sean Bagshaw, um, um, Adam Gibbs, of course, Theo Bosboom, Guy Tal, and all of us are really saying the same thing, that it's, it's, it's allowing us to be childlike again. It's this sort of little fascination with the with the intricate little details you know reflections and puddles and the way light shines through trees obviously you spend a lot of time in glaciers and the way light bangs around inside of those it's just like looking through one of those spiroscopes when we were a child again um and that that inquisitiveness and curiosity um would you say that they are kind of fundamental attributes that fuel creativity I would say so for sure. Um, I would say so. I, I think I've had times where I've had times where I tried a, a, an, an approach to photography that was not maybe as driven by curiosity. I, I've been guilty of just going out there and trying to um, maybe create images that um, make an impact that impress people at times. And, and, and the, my curiosity sort of uh, went out the window uh, during those various time periods. And I look at the work that came out of those, those periods of time in my life. And um, I, I, I don't know, I, I'm not, um, I feel like it's definitely not the strongest, the strongest work that I've created. And I think part of it is because um, it's because I wasn't allowing that sort of curiosity to take over the whole process and drive, drive my photography. And, and because of that, I was also having moments in the field where um, I was more sort of result oriented. And so I would, if I didn't get the images that I was a little bit tunnel visioned into getting, I would come home disappointed. And then, right. you know, I would go to Moraine Lake and the sky wouldn't light up for me. And I would go home with a negative experience. And after right. a while of doing that, you sort of think, wait, hang on. I, I, I have the luxury to go to places like this on a regular basis. I think I owe it to the rest of the world to, I cannot come home from Moraine Lake with a negative experience. I need, mm -hmm. I need to, I think it's time to put the experience and, and the curiosity ahead of the, ahead of the results and the, even the photography. So, um, yeah, so I, I think it's curiosity and that inquisitiveness is absolutely crucial to my own process for sure. I could absolutely hug you right now. <laughs> I think that it's it's such a a beautiful thing to hear because you know now I think there's a big difference between being an amateur photographer and a photographer that's trying to build a photography business because I think when you and I back in 2014 we were both at that sort of part where we were growing our photography businesses and six or seven years down the line we're, we 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 both have successful photography businesses and I think what that's allowing us to do now is to have a different relationship with our images 
partly because we don't have to impress to that same level. You know, we've, we've already got our the sort of cornerstones of our, well, our, our ethos, our message, you know. And I think perhaps when you're trying to drive your business forward, um, there, there's that popularity thing that you have to weigh up against the integrity of your creativity. So that that might just be an, a byproduct of that, because obviously the word amateur, which uh, you're from the East Coast, aren't you? So I'm from Quebec. Yeah. Yeah. So the amateur is for the love. You know, it's it's the it's its roots is uh, for the love of it, and it, the word amateur is always looked on as a negative rather than a positive. I'd love to be an amateur. You know, and I, I think that's where we are now is that we have this love for what we do, um, and as you say, by putting the experience first, the images it opens up this much broader avenue of possibility. Now, something you touched on there uh, was we're all locked up. Um, you know, we're, I'm, I'm not making any photographs. It'll be, this will be my sixth week without being out with a camera. Um, and every time I get to go for a walk out in the countryside here, I'm noticing just these tiny little details. You know, the wood anemones are coming out and the way the light's shining through the new foliage. And, and I think there's a, this fresh appreciation for what sometimes we take for granted. How do you feel about that? Do you, is it going to be different for you when you get back out into the mountains this time? I, I think, I think there's, there's, the way I see there's two, um, there's two kinds of, uh, of people in a way and how they interact with nature. There's people like you and me, we have this long established connection with the wilderness, we know how much value it's added to our lives. And, and right away when this happened, I think we both knew, right, oh my gosh, I'm going to miss being out there as freely as, as I'm used to. Mm. And I think you're gonna, have, you're gonna have a lot of people who maybe are not as aware of how much nature adds to their lives already. And they're about to, they're about to notice it big time, I think. Uh, and, and I think just even it doesn't have to be wilderness in the sense of, you know, being four days away from the road, but just just your, the forest behind people's houses or, mm. or the coastline that you can just casually walk to every day. But that may, you never do because it's always there. It's always, you know, it, it can wait sort of thing. And all of a sudden uh, you can't have it for an undetermined period of time. And so in for me, right away, I realized how much I was going to miss, say, the backcountry um, mm. and those, those types of adventures. So um, it's definitely going to affect the way that I interact with nature. I mean, I definitely intend to get after it when I'm allowed to again. I, I want to really, and, and I don't have any, I haven't been holding back. I've been getting out a fair bit over the last few years, but yeah. uh, it, it's a good, good reminder to, to just keep doing that because it can be taken away at a moment's notice. And I, I, I agree with you. I think, um, I, I think it's going to make us better observers. And usually that, usually that translates into uh, better photography because you're, you're able, yeah, you're more able to notice the little things that in the past, you know, I live in the mountains. Um, I, I've been guilty of power walking through the forest to get the tree line where the views open up and not really paying attention to what lies on the side of the trail. And now... Right. You know, when I get out behind the house with the girls, I found that uh, I've got a more sort of acute, um, I'm more more acute observer for sure. And that's part of it is just getting out with kids is always good that way. Absolutely. Yeah, but but I think just um, yeah, j just seeing seeing you know when seeing the beauty beyond just the, the big wide epic scenes, um, I, I think. I think that'll be much clearer, much easier to see that beauty once we're allowed to to explore freely again. So, you know, it's, I know your work really well. You know, I mean, I've seen a huge amount of your work. And you have, you talked earlier about expectations and, and kind of being methodical towards things. A lot of your images, particularly like night photography, where people are ice climbing up frozen waterfalls with auroras and things like that. I mean, they take a lot of thought and planning and pre-visualization. Do you have times where you're 
on the complete flip side of that and you just get totally sucked into some small intimate scene and you know that that's fueling some other aspect of who you are yeah that's a great question i think over the years i've i've learned that i think i need a balance of both approaches so a more on the one hand uh, to have you know a more spontaneous approach where you just go in the forest camera in hand and whatever happens happens and whatever speaks to you then if you if you commit to a mushroom for an hour then so be it you know um and and on on the at the other end of the spectrum i've also really found that uh, i like that approach of i mean i hate to call it staging because it's got a maybe of a bit more of a negative um side to it but i like the approach of kind of dreaming up images that maybe appear to be to have a slight chance of happening at first glance but if you actually sit down and make a road map and look at all the it's a very methodical way of operating you look at all the things that need to align for this image to come to exist mm. and then find a lot of those images involve teamwork because there's other models involved and so when you know it's a whole different way of doing photography it's a whole different process um i enjoy both just just as right. much um and and i think uh my intention is to keep doing a bit of both i i love um but you know I, i'm able just like you i'm able to go out and do you know do some some amount of exploring and i've really enjoyed just a more spontaneous approach just because those those sort of planned out grand images they're just not possible at the moment so i've just right. been falling back on that more spontaneous approach and usually it's not the approach that leads to um you know the 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 grand wow factor images but uh, i've managed to generate a few images that i like out of that process and they don't have mountains in them or anything um, my god yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, no i I, i like i like both approaches i i think they they tap into different parts of my brain and and uh and may, maybe make me a more versatile photographer in a way no this is a really interesting thing that you've managed to raise there as well because i i believe that we exist on a spectrum where we have different aspects or facets of our personalities and some days you might wake wake up feeling a little bit more melancholy a little bit less energized uh, the weight of the world is 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 hanging on you a bit heavier than other days um and as you say if i think if you're tuned into the landscape if you're open to that spectrum you know going out on a cloudy day and still finding something to be fascinated about uh you know it doesn't have to be great the sunset light and auroras and stuff like that but i i think what i've found is that by being open to that spectrum of uh, all the sides of our personality it allows you to be creative regardless of what's going on and it's about finding yourself in the landscape based on that version of who you are at that time and that really strikes me with you is that you you know i've seen all these different facets of your personality and i think it's a way to express yourself across a broader spectrum of of output and i think it's far more healthy rather than just throwing everything into one particular area Yeah, I agree with you and I think it's it's something that's kind of um it, it's hard to um it's hard to stick to that in a way because there's so you know the the photo community just aside you know every everything everybody's trying to put you in the box in one way or another you know oh you're the guy who shoots this or you're the guy who shoots that and so it, it, you you start to believe yourself that you should only listen to one one facet of yourself and you should only try to create one type of uh, of image and it's something that i think a lot of us fight constantly that this sort of pigeonholing that's happening but no i i totally i totally agree with you on that elster and it's something that um it's something that i've really um enjoyed in your your previous discussions uh is is how the idea that photography can really allow you to showcase um you know reflections of the different facets of your personality and it's really it's really as much about i've all i started out seeing photography as so much more uh 
100 percent about the landscape and the subject that i'm shooting right. and i think the more you shoot the more you the more you realize that you inject just so much of yourself in that and and I, that's something that i've really appreciated about your your discussions with others yeah, you know, and I think that what's coming through a lot of these discussions is that we all share. I think there's this, again, I'm really into spectrums just now in that, you know, I, th I think the landscape lives in a spectrum uh, where sometimes the light can be amazing and sometimes the light can be crappy and sometimes it's winter and everything's kind of closed in and other times it's summer where it's all open and lush and vibrant. You know, so there's a there's a spectrum of the landscape's personality to a certain extent, and it won't move. It won't shift for our expectation. Uh, so it's it's who we are when we go into the landscape that has the biggest input or the, the biggest impact on the output. Um, if the output is in t is in any way important at all, um, and I guess it is. You know, because. I think something that Adam and I talk about quite a lot is how meaningless a lot of photography is now um, in that there's so much photography that each individual photograph kind of gets lost in this sort of, um, well, they get lost in kind of hard drives in Google, uh, you know, <laughs> somewhere, you know, um, but it's, I want to go back to that thing about our relationship with the landscape because it's easy for us to look at the landscape as a commodity. Whereas I think what's happening now is it's an opportunity for us to have conversations like this, because I mean, you have a lot of influence, you know, you're a, you're a popular person, you have an influence out there in the world, your images are very influential, the way you teach is very influential. And I think for us to have these conversations, uh, we have an opportunity to sort of say to people, well, if the photographs aren't that important, what is important, you know? And so for me, it's, it's, it's how, can, how can we articulate that in a way that puts the emphasis more onto the conservation and, you know, man, I mean, you live in a big national park. I mean, it's a very popular national park where you live. And it's how do we balance the number of people that want to go and enjoy these places with maintaining the integrity of the place? Absolutely. And it's, it's really a topic that is, I mean, prior to the pandemic, it was the hot topic here living in Banff. You know, um, you go to the post office, the grocery store, that's what people are talking about. Right. How, are we gonna make it, how are we going to make it work in a way that's, that's sustainable? Um, we're, we're definitely on the front lines of that phenomenon of totally, uh, it's, you know, there's a lot more money that's been spent on marketing than, than the management. And so we're running into a whole lot of issues and you can't blame people for wanting to come, of course. Um, but right now I think is a good time. Like you said, how often does the world come to complete standstill that right. has happened for a long time? And so I think there's definitely an opportunity to just take a hard look at how we've been operating and what, you know, how did we get in, into those, um, in, how did we dig ourselves into a hole as we have now in, in, as, you know, in Banff National Park and other places and what, yeah, what can we do about it now that we're given sort of a, a bit of a fresh slate to work with? Um, I think, yeah, the, the timing, if the timing's not good now, I mean, it'll never be, it'll, it'll never be good. So that's I feel, right. I think, you know, in a way we need changes at different levels. I think we need changes both at a, you know, high, large scale government level, which right now, I don't know if it's going to happen because, well, 99% of the attention of our, the, the governments are, are, is taken up by this, this pandemic. And so I think the changes hopefully will happen on an individual level and people will have to do their own reflecting hopefully you know i think this period's been long enough that um all of us hopefully have had a chance to reflect on our relationship with nature and what what we want to do differently once we're allowed to go out again it could it could go either way right because we're just the whole world is is prevented from going out in nature um 
it's it's hard it's your guess is as good as mine are we going to see that more of the type of questionable behavior that we've seen in the past um it or or, or are people actually going to think about the way that they interact with the landscape and whether their own actions are are, are, sust- are sustainable I, I i wish i wish i could say i was in, i was optimistic about that um but you know, and I think this is the irony of the whole thing is that we've had this situation where, you know, for, for, for some of us, I mean, I think we're into our sixth week here in Scotland. Uh, I obviously lived in China for an, a large number of years, 15 or so years. And when they lifted their travel restrictions in China, the people, the number of people that went to Huangshan, you know, to Yellow Mountain, right. it was just insane. I mean, it was like, it was, I can't remember the actual numbers, but it was it was like a million people turned up to go up Yellow Mountain and they had to close all the lifts and stuff because there was just so many people up there. So I think I'd love to believe that once these restrictions are lifted and we have an opportunity to reassess where we want to go and what we want to do there and what what's the point of being there and what are we trying to achieve by being there? Um, nothing makes me happier than finding an anonymous forest somewhere and just going for a walk or a piece of coast that I don't know and things like that. That kind of sense of exploration, you spend a lot of time in the back country in very unfamiliar places. So uh, these are, I'd, I'd love for people to say, right, there's no point in going to a lot of these iconic places because the photographs have been seen a thousand times or a million times before I'm going to go into my local park or my local woodland or my local bit of coastline or whatever and find something that intrigues me. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I can't say I'm a hundred percent optimistic that the world is going to do what we'd hope. (laughs) Well, at least, you know, I think it's a testament to how much people need, nature hopefully the fact that people just rush to those places well that's second, a valid point the second that they're allowed to um unfortunately i think it's the same situation here is 99 percent of the people go to the same five or ten locations mm. and those those places are beyond repair now it, there's it, it's going to take a very very long time for any recovery to happen meanwhile 99 percent of the park is empty right um, and I think part of it is just, I think, people people travel and take photographs in a different way maybe than they used to, where they, they show up with less time and want to do more. And I feel like that's what we're observing here in, in a hot spot of tourism is people, whether or not they're photographers, they show up and they they spend on average less time at any given spot than they used to, and they, they, they're going to visit you know, um, you know, 25 locations in one day if they can. Right. And I think, um, I think, unfortunately, it's just that prevents, you know, a true connection with a true appreciation of any of those spots and a true uh, connection with any of those. And as you mentioned before, I think that's kind of what leads to wanting to, you know, you, then you start caring with the place and you start looking at how do we conserve it. And unfortunately, uh, that type, that type of going about traveling and photography just doesn't lend itself to that. Right. Yeah. It's it's a difficult situation, and, and I think this was really part of the purpose of this the, these discussions. You know, with everyone that I'm having these talks with, and we're all basically saying the same thing. Now, we're obviously all going to get some degree of challenging uh, backlash because we live in beautiful places, uh, and our backyard is. Uh, in many cases, these iconic places. I mean, I live half an hour from Glencoe on the west coast of Scotland. And, uh, you know, I used to live on the Isle of Skye. And you, obviously, you live in the middle of Banff National Park. So we're very fortunate that our backyard is beautiful. Uh, so I think we have to be uh, also considerate of the fact that we are incredibly blessed with what we can do in, and where we live. Um, now, something that's uh, happening with all of us is that you know, these conversations weren't possible a few months ago. I mean, you'd be away in Greenland or uh, in the Rockies and I was away in Morocco or Finland or in the west of Scotland running our workshops. You know, there was a large amount of our time was spent doing that. 
So I'm very grateful of being able to have an opportunity to do these. But what's happening is I think there's a big swing to online presenting. Uh, and I noticed that you've started up a Patreon um, channel where you're offering yourself up for uh, online um mentoring and also uh, weekly uh, one-to-ones and uh, various online tasks. Would you like to share with us a little bit about that? Yeah, for sure. It's been a great adventure. You know, it's, they're the types of things that were always in the back of my mind that I always wanted to do for the last few years and that people seem to show interest in. There seemed to be demand, but as you said, because of all, you know, the, the, the moving around and, and just the other types of the business were busy, I could never get to them. And so as soon as, as soon as we became sort of geographically restricted, it was, it was the obvious, it was an obvious option. Well, finally, I'm going to be able to offer this. And uh, the response has been great. And it's been, yeah, and it's been wonderful to work more on a one-on-one basis with people. I'm used to um, working with larger groups when we go in the field. And I used to do some one-on-one private instruction when I first started. And it's something that I, I missed over the years for sure. And so, yeah, it's been great. And we've been doing, um, yeah, what, trying, trying to help people along on their, on their photo journey, whether they want to make a business out of it, whether they're, they want to remain amateurs, um, and, you know, whether they want some pointers in the post-processing world or whether they want to just um, an on- honest feedback on, on their images, a bit of everything. But it's been, it's been a great way to just really stay immersed in the world of photography right. in, a, in a time where a, a lot of the, we can't explore all of the other avenues. It's so great. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to really put you on the spot now um, because it's my show <laughs> uh, and what I was going to just say there is so what would if, if you could let's say you've got someone who's been shooting for a few years they've got uh, they've invested some equipment they've done some studying they're they're finding their feet they're but they're struggling to find their creativity I mean creativity is one of these uh, it's almost like enlightenment as far as I'm concerned. It's, it's one of these, it's very hard to find and it's very hard to pin down. Um, what would you say would be some good ways that people can explore their creativity or find their creativity? Oh that's gosh, such a, good, such a good <laughs> question, yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's, that's something that I just want to grab people by the arm and just drag them into the wilderness. So it's, it's so much easier, I think, to, to explore that area of photography when you're out there in the field and things just genuinely excite you in front of you. It's, it's something that, yeah, just through the screen, I think it's just so hard to, it, it's, it's hard. It's a hard one to tackle for sure. I mean, one thing, one thing is that I usually tell people is to just, I think people are, are really concerned about, they're so concerned about the creativity happening. It's, it's almost like when you, when you want to fall asleep and you can't because you're really, really thinking hard about it. Um, I think so, a part of it, a large part of it for me anyways, just happens kind of organically by putting other things first, such as, as we talked about, you know, the, the desire for exploration and seeing what's around the corner and, and just um, allowing yourself to be a kid again. And then I think that's where you at least put yourself in a space where creativity, creativity can emerge out, out of seemingly nowhere a little bit. It's not something that I think you can, you can force. And I think I used, to, I used to think that, okay, I'm gonna go out today and be creative. Um, mm-hmm. and, and I think one, if I made that the main purpose of my outing, I just, uh, no, I just came, I just, it just became a roadblock for some reason. And so I usually, when I'm, when I'm able to go in the field with people and they, maybe they feel, they feel like they're just recreating what they've seen online or they, they just run out of ideas. They don't, they're overwhelmed. Um, usually I'll just send them out for a walk, to be honest. That's, mm-hmm. that's the starting point for me. And, and it's worked for a lot of other people. Yeah, apologies for throwing that one in your face. It was. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that some of these questions can come out of left field somewhere, and it's like, what's going on? 
<laughs> it's, like, well, it's, a, it's a great question. I think it's something that it's something that is, uh, you know, again, it's it, they're, the, they're, they're the types of questions that we're able to give some thought to, especially when life slows down a little bit, like like now. Whereas, you know, when you're hopping, yeah, from one workshop to another, it's easy to they're easy questions to overlook for sure. I think the you know one of the things I've always liked about this format since we started it is there's a spontaneity to it and the if I think if you ask a question like that out of nowhere where it's suddenly you have to sort of because you know we're, we're professional photographers we talk and think about photography pretty much 365 days a year and I think the only reason I ask these questions is because I know you're totally capable of giving the answer. Um, but sometimes it's that spontaneity of answer that actually reveals the, the profundity of it. You know, you, you, I find it a lot easier to cut to the essence. If I ask you something that you're expecting me to an ask you, then you have an opportunity to think about it and you start formulating answers that, that, that sometimes they might be more uh, succinct and they might be more thought out answers, but I think sometimes you lose that spontaneity. And for me, that's what creativity is, is being spontaneous. Um, and I think, I mean, the word, the word mindfulness is thrown out around an awful lot and living in the moment. And it's become a little bit uh, post-millennial, you know, it, it's become a little bit too... Uh, chat show ish i suppose it's become a little bit celebrity and a little bit popular but what you describe in terms of your relationship with the landscape is mindfulness you know it, it's being out in the wilderness listening to the landscape responding to the landscape and creating in a very unconscious type of way so yeah i think you i think you hit the nail right in the head go for a walk in the forest you know um, so I, I, I think there's that inwardness, you know, that introverted uh, looking inside of us, because for me, creativity doesn't exist outside of myself, um, you know, and, and I think your work is exactly that, you know, your work is so distinctively you, um, that I think that's, that it's just fascinating, which is why I was so desperate to talk to you. No, I really appreciate that. And I have to say, it's pretty refreshing to be able to answer new questions that you're right it's the same questions that come back a lot uh and they're probably questions that tend to generate you know answers that that again just like um you know instagrammable and you know answers that people that are very likable that are easy to digest but it's really nice to be bombarded by different types of questions for sure I'm going to try and get one more question in before we before we have to close. I think I'm just going to be slightly mindful of the time and not making it so long that people can't listen to all of it. Um, which is, there's something very refreshing in your work in that it it's not very conformist. Yeah, the, the, you you tend to juxtapose a lot of quite conflicting elements you know whether it's underwater with above the surface of the water or the way you position things in the frame creates tension and the, there's, there's quite a lot of i believe there's an awful lot of there's an emotional fingerprint to a photograph and i think the thing with your photographs is that they have a very unique emotional fingerprint in that they're not very templated you know, the, the, there's not a lot of rules or conformality in your work. And is that something that's just coming out of you in an unconscious way? Or are you consciously not complying to rules? Or are rules and guidelines or those sorts of more traditional rules of photography, do they play any part in your work at all? Uh, I don't know. I've never really paid I haven't paid attention to the rules for a number of years now, to be honest. I, I think I just, uh, I think I just go by feel really. Um, and, and I mean, I think you, you do, you do tons of teaching too. It's something you're always battling. So I don't know, you know, if I ever find a person who's just ahead of me giving people all those rules um, to, to go by, then, then you have to undo all that. Right. Because right. so much of photography, it, it just, I don't know. It, it makes, eventually it makes everything about math and then it takes a lot of the magic and the mystery out of it. And I think it's nice to, it's nice to retain some of that, um, 
yeah, some of that mystery in photography. And I think, and I think a lot of it is just by feel. You just, you're just, you just see a moment that you like, and then even as you, as you compose, as you frame it, as you sort of look through, look through the camera, you just at some point you've got something, and and you know you have it, and it just gives you that that rush that that you like, that that you feel like you you're onto something, and then you kind of build on it, and. And oh, how can I can okay now I'm in the right direction. How can I take it even further? And so, um, you know, I've definitely I'm still guilty of just microwaving the same old ideas at times for sure. Where I'll go, you know, I'll I'll be in a position that I recognize that I've been in that position before, and that's how I went about creating my shot two or three years ago. And so I resort to, yeah, the 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 same old tried and true techniques. And I may or may not end up with an image that's kind of forgettable, but right. uh, so I think I think the the sooner the sooner you you uh, throw the rules out the window, I think I think the better the better for your for your photography. And like you said, um, there's so much photography being created right now, and a lot of the images that you know when I when I sort of mindlessly scrolled, a lot of the images that that stop me in my tracks are images that don't go by the rules and that are unusual in one way or another. And oftentimes I can't even put my finger on why they're, why they're unusual, but, but I know that that's what, hang on. I've never seen, I've never seen this type of forest scene work that way before. That's interesting. Yeah. Whereas you're used to seeing the same types of um, recipes being used over and over again. And so I think as, as a, as a, someone who consumes a lot of photography you get very good at recognizing when something is done differently which which is something that i love about your work and adam's work is something that um you know it's it's yeah a lot, a lot of the images are break a lot of rules if you don't mind me saying <laughs> yeah absolutely and it's again the reason i asked the question is it's not something i do consciously it's nothing oh well I'm, i can't put that element there because um you know it's it is like you say, it's it's tapping into how you innately see the world or how you innately resonate with something. And this is where we, we come back full circle to that concept of there's a spectrum of our personality. If if we're all so different, you know, if we've got these diverse ways of seeing the world and feeling the world, how can we create images by templates? It just doesn't allow enough room for all the diversity that exists. Uh, so yeah, I'm I'm very anti-rule uh, personally, and I don't even believe that you need to know them in the first place. Uh, I don't believe they, they they actually form a good foundation, other than getting someone from zero to uh, predictable very very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's yeah. There's uh, there's those recipes that that exist out there that. Uh, that that yeah will lead will lead you directly to popularity if that's if that's what you're after. But I think sooner or later photography has to be about more than that. Uh, of course, when you when you try to do photography as a profession, you have to appeal to at least a few people out there. So you have to have some amount of of popularity. You can't be completely unknown. But I think that it it yeah, it's not it's not what can drive your photography in, in uh in the long term. Just like it's you can't let the rules sort of uh, dictate what you're gonna do out there. I strongly feel after this conversation that we're going to have to do this again. I agree. There's there's so much more I'd like to talk <laughs> over here. Yeah. And, uh, and, and we've we've touched on some great great topics, but um, no, I absolutely love the format, Alistair, and great. I love I love how we've uh, an hour ago I had no dire- no direction, I had no idea where we were going to go with it, and I think we went lots of interesting places. For sure, it, it's uh, well, I, I just feel very blessed to be able to have a chat with you because I'm, I'm a big big fan of your work. I've always admired your work, and not just the, the images themselves, but your whole approach to the landscape I, I just think is admirable and you're a great ambassador for Canada uh, and any country that can deliver the greatness of Geddy Lee, Alex Lifeson and the late magnificent Neil Peart has to be admired. Thanks so much. That means a lot. <laughs> okay, well, let's wrap it up now and thank you very much, Paul Ziska, and we will talk again very soon for sure. Thanks for the opportunity, Lister. No worries, man. <laughs>